the future is unwritten. So what comes next is ours to run. We are the game changers. Hands on with real world impact. We redesign the room and reimagine the concept. Together, limited by nothing. Because when you write the future, there's always another page. So what's next? Find out at RMIT. It's that thrill of a new opportunity of shared connection, of wrapping your head around how it all works. It's closing the pitch on a game-changing idea, the late nights spent with your teammates, and how industry shapes the world with each disruption, innovation, twist and turn. When we talk about business, it's more than just outdated corporate notions. It goes beyond water cooler conversations, nine to fives or profit and loss. It's fighting for the social and environmental impact of commercial decisions. It's learning the right questions to ask. It's finding the glass ceiling and breaking through. When we say business, we mean new models of enriched economies at local and global scale. We mean what's next for future skills, technology and beyond. When we say business, we mean it. The future is unwritten. So what comes next is ours to write. We are the game changers. Hands on with real world impact. We redesign the room and reimagine the concept together limited by nothing because when you write the future there's always another page so what's next find out at rmit it's that thrill of a new opportunity of shared connection of wrapping your head around how it all works it's closing the pitch on a game-changing idea the late nights spent with your teammates and how industry shapes the world with each disruption innovation, twist and turn. When we talk about business, it's more than just outdated corporate notions. It goes beyond water cooler conversations, nine to fives or profit and loss. It's fighting for the social and environmental impact of commercial decisions. It's learning the right questions to ask. It's finding the glass ceiling and breaking through. When we say business, we mean new models of enriched economies at local and global scale. We mean what's next for future skills, technology and beyond. When we say business, we mean it. The future is unwritten. So what comes next is ours to write. We are the game changers. Hands on with real world impact. We redesign the room and reimagine the concept together, limited by nothing. Because when you write the future, there's always another page. So what's next? Find out at RMIT. It's that thrill of a new opportunity, of shared connection, of wrapping your head around how it all works. It's closing the pitch on a game-changing idea, the late nights spent with your teammates, and how industry shapes the world with each disruption, innovation, twist and turn. When we talk about business, it's more than just outdated corporate notions. It goes beyond water cooler conversations, nine to fives or profit and loss. It's fighting for the social and environmental impact of commercial decisions. It's learning the right questions to ask. It's finding the glass ceiling and breaking through. When we say business, we mean new models of enriched economies at local and global scale. We mean what's next for future skills, technology and beyond. When we say business, we mean it. Welcome, Welcome everyone. everyone. My name is Bernardo Figueredo, and I am an associate professor at the School of Economics, Finance and Marketing and co-founder of the Shaping Connections Network. 
Um, Shaping Connections is an initiative of RMIT together with the University of the Third Age, uh, and it includes both academics and um, industry partners with projects uh, that seek the digital inclusions of older Australians. So today's event has four distinguished presenters, Liz, Wayne, Glenn and Mike. Each will give their um, talk and we'll engage in about five, 15 minutes Q&A at the end of the sessions. I, I really encourage you all to submit your questions via the Q&A chat function on the right hand side of your screen and the panel will try to answer as many questions as possible after the talks during the Q&A time. If you cannot see the chat function, and this may happen with Microsoft Teams sometimes, I recommend that you log off and log on again, and it should come up. We will be sharing some of the web links and email addresses with you during the presentations in case you want to contact the presenters or get involved with the initiative. Um, the translation feature is enabled to help those who prefer languages other than English and the Teams live events use Microsoft automatic speech recognition to generate live captions. Select the three dots on your toolbar and turn on the live captions. Now, before we officially begin the webinar, I would like to introduce you to our reconciliation advisor, Karen Steele. Karen works here at the College of Business and will offer a welcome to country for us. Hello, Garen. Hi, Bernardo, and uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, yes, my name is Garen Yarman Steele. I'm the Reconciliation Advisor for the College of Business and Law, and I am also a traditional owner uh, of Bunurang descent. So, in the words of my ancestors, I'd like to say, Wamanjika Merimbikbik, Bunurang Namda Baraptan Atawilam. And that translates to come with purpose to my beautiful home, land of the two bays. It is such a pleasure to be here with you here today, but it is also an important responsibility, uh, a responsibility that I've inherited from those that come before me. I'd like to acknowledge uh, those individuals being my mother, Nawit Carolyn Briggs, my great great grandfather and my great great grandmother, Louisa Briggs and John Briggs, um, who were born on this country back in the 1820s. I would also like to take a moment to acknowledge RMIT's commitment to reconciliation and the importance that it is play, uh, the important role that plays today. Now, one part of the welcome to country I said at the very start was woman Jekka, and, and, and what that essentially translates to is come with purpose. And it's not a request as so much as a command. <laughs> so you're actually being told that you're supposed to come here with purpose, an important purpose something that's bigger than yourself. Think about the important reason that you're here today. It might be to contribute, it might be to listen, but that's a really important thing to reflect on. The second part of any welcome to country is what we call the promise. And this relates to our creation story. You see the lands where we meet today, the lands where RMIT operates was created by Bunjil and he created the Bunurang people. And he gave us the responsibility for protecting land. And in order to protect the land, we had to ask all guests to make two promises. The first promise was not to harm the land or the children of Bunjil. And the second promise was to honour and respect the laws of Bunjil. Honouring the laws of knowledge, for example, understanding the importance that knowledge plays in our day-to-day -day lives. Community, inviting and valuing diversity, but binding it with common purpose. And of course, honouring sacred ground. Being able to celebrate the 80,000 years of human history that has occurred on the lands where we live and where we work. If we can make that promise, I can say once again, in the words of my mother, Womanjeka Merambikbik, Bunurang Namda Baraptan Atawilam. Thank you very much. Thank you, Garen, for the heartfelt welcome to country. I came here with a purpose. <laughs> So that's that part is uh, fulfilled. Um, today's webinar is part of the RMIT's Thought Leadership webinar series on the digital acceleration in business and society. And today we focus on one of the most important challenges policymakers and communities are facing worldwide, which is digital inclusion. 
The latest Australian Digital Inclusion Index has shown improvements in digital inclusions, but the gaps between the digitally included Australians and the digitally excluded Australians are substantial, and these gaps are widening for some groups. The COVID crisis has stressed the need to help these groups to move across the digital divide, but it has also provided opportunities for some groups to make the big leap forward. Collaborations among universities, government and communities and businesses play a key role in this process. Today's presenters will talk about these issues and opportunities in digital inclusion. I will now um, introduce the four presenters. So our first presenter is Liz Jones. Liz has more than 20 years experience in digital transformation across health, government, community and not-for-profit and commercial sectors. Uh, Liz leads Good Things Foundation work in collaboration with partner organizations to develop and deliver new models of support to ensure that digital inclusion programs are appropriate to the different disadvantaged groups. Today, Liz will present a summary of the latest digital inclusion research as outlined in the Good Things Foundation Digital Nation 2021 report, and will talk through some of the work that they are leading, which aims to address the digital divide. Welcome, Liz. Thanks, Bernardo. Thank you for having me. And um, it's great to have so many people on the call today. So, yeah, as you said, I'll be taking you through um, essentially a summary of um, a piece of work that we do. Um, we've kind of done it every year, but not to this level. But because this has been, you know, an unprecedented time in terms of COVID and the impacts of COVID, there's been a huge amount of research that's been done um, in terms of people's access to digital technology and use of it. So um, we've pulled together a full report this year called Digital Nation Australia 2021, um, which is available on our website. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a summary on that. Um, before I begin, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians, the land on which I'm coming from today. I'm on the lands of the Gubby Gubby people on the Sunshine Coast. Um, and um, so I'll be giving you this broad picture and then subsequent presentations will focus on some more of the, the specific aspects around digital inclusion. Next slide, please. Um, so I'll just give you a bit of an overview as to Good Things Foundation. If you've not already heard of us, um, we are part of the Good Things Foundation group. Um, which is supporting digital inclusion around the world. So um, originally set up in the UK and we've been here in Australia for um, about four years now. And our vision is a world where everyone benefits from digital. And so we help people to have the skills and confidence to use technology for the benefit of their everyday lives. So really to be happier, healthier and better off is our aim. And we essentially fully work entirely to design, deliver um, in partnership with other organisations, digital inclusion programmes that really create social impact. Um, we've um, partnered with a, an Australia wide network of community organisations um, and we partner also with stakeholders in government, business, universities um, and others as well. Um, and the way that we do that is through upskilling digital mentors within local communities. And this has been a very um, successful approach and it really enables that hyper local approach to, to delivery at scale. So it's um, it's very um, tailored for specific communities, but we can do that nationally. Um, the picture on the screen is one of the, our community partners from Pottsville Beach Neighbourhood Centre, actually. Next slide, please. And so we build digital skills and, um, as I said, digital mentoring capability um, in a wide variety of community organisations, and that's um, approximately 5, um, 3,500 now nationally. So we partner with libraries, community centres, refugee um, and multicultural centres, even you kind of men sheds, a lot of men sheds and CWAs, um, all sorts of different organisations. And the aim is to introduce people um, to people in a safe, trusted environment um, using an interest based learning approach so very much looking at people's motivations to get online and working with that to introduce digital skills next slide please um, and so um, i'm just going to talk then a bit about digital nation australia and the reports and some of the key points coming out of that 
Um, and as I said, um, this is very much compiling research from, from multiple different places. And one of those um, sources of data is, of course, the Digital Inclusion Index, um, which RMIT is, is very much involved in. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to the next version coming out, um, index being released later this year. Next slide, please. So, um, I mean, essentially, you know, digital inclusion is an equity issue. There is a divide currently between those who can afford to own and um, maintain digital devices and um, internet connection and are confident and capable and able to use it. And then those on the other hand that can't. And so this infographic on the screen here is, is our um, visual representation of the di digital divide. And I think we all recognise that we're living in a digital world and digital skills are no longer a nice to have, but really are an essential part of um, ensuring equal participation in society today. Um, and look at a high level, everything is pointing to the fact that digital inclusion in Australia is improving, um, particularly you know, driven by the pandemic over the last um, 18 months or so. But we can't forget that there are people still being left behind, people that can't keep up, people that don't have the digital skills or confidence or and or can't afford the technology um, to participate um, and get involved. So in the picture you can see there on the right um, in green, you've got those that are the most digitally included. Um, so these are people that live in capital cities or on higher income, um, higher income, so over about 150K total combined income, um, tertiary educated, and those that are younger, so between the ages of sort of 14 to 49. On the left hand side in red there, you can see the groups that are most at risk of becoming um, excluded or are excluded, almost at risk of becoming excluded and really, you know, from participating in modern society. So we have people that are over the age of 65. We have our First Nations people. We have people living in rural and remote areas in Australia people with disabilities, people that are unemployed or on low incomes, um, people with lower levels of education, new migrants and refugees, particularly out of those kind of cold communities, it's particularly the new migrants and refugees that seem to be at most at risk. Um, and generally, uh, women are generally more at risk of digital exclusion, and particularly if they have um, sort of fit into those other categories as well, so that they're kind of even more disadvantaged. And then the bridges um, across the Little River, the Digital Divide River there, the three key aspects to digital inclusion that really will help to bridge that digital divide are being able to address the affordability issues, the ability, which is the confidence and skills, and then the access, so the, the um, actually having the technology and having a reliable internet connection. So you really have to be addressing all three of those if you want to address digital inclusion. Next slide, please. Um, so just some of the key highlights. And I, as I said, you can read the, the, the report in more detail, but I'll just go through some of the key points. Um, you know, essentially, as I said, the impact of the pandemic is that many people now are online that previously weren't. So they've had to quickly get online in order to keep really keep in touch with family, friends, you know, buy groceries online, some really key aspects of their life, particularly when you've been in lockdown. Um, but this was really, really hard for some people to do. 40% uh, of people surveyed were um, concerned that learning new digital skills during the pandemic was a big challenge. And many of our community partners themselves have been challenged by using, removing, uh, moving to remote delivery of services. Um, and then the other aspect is around that affordability, um, which is a key barrier for many, many people. Half of low income families with home internet access have really have difficulty paying for it. Uh, next slide, please. And then we know that not everyone has the digital skills and com confidence to keep up. So less than 40% of the people that were surveyed, surveyed in the last 12 months feel that they can keep up with technology. One out of two people are concerned about their online safety 
and 61% lack confidence in identifying misinformation online. So there's huge amounts of support still needed for people, even if they do actually get online. And then some of the impacts for some of the key groups, so particularly um, First, Nation, First Nation school children, 21% don't have access um, at home, digital access at home. So very much being disadvantaged in terms of their education, particularly for those in, um, in lockdown. Um, people with disabilities, as I've mentioned, they're at higher risk of digital exclusion and those that are online are then also more likely to experience cyberbullying and digital <coughs> use, and particularly women with a disability. So again, there needs to be more support and education available. Um, there's a significantly lower use of apps to communicate for people over the age of 65 than for those that are between 18 and 34. So again, there's, there's a huge difference in the usage. Um, next slide, please. What am I doing for time? Did I hear a gong? It's um, it's finished. <laughs> oh, pretty well. That's okay. We can we can stop there. I didn't quite get through it all, but that's absolutely fine. I think just one of the key points to kind of add in at the end is just, you know, there is a lot happening, and there's a lot more awareness and recognition of the importance of digital inclusion for people. Um, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done to make sure that everyone can participate equally in the world. So thank you very much. Thank you, Liz. Um, it's wonderful uh, graphics that you had there, really beautiful. Um, and uh, we have a chance to talk more with you in the Q&A, so that's a chance to ask the questions that were what we couldn't hear. Um, now I'm going to introduce you Wayne Hawkins. Uh, Wayne is the Director of Inclusion with the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, ACAN. Um, Wayne joined ACAN in 2010 as the Disability Policy Advisor and has led ACAN's work on telecommunications access for consumers with disability, broadcast television access for people with disability, and emergency services. So prior to joining ACAN, Wayne was National Policy Officer with Blind Citizens Australia. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks, Bernardo. It's um, really great to be here for the event today. I'm very pleased to participate in, in this exciting um, discussion. Um, digital inclusion obviously is a key interest in the work that ACAN does. And just for those of you who are not aware of ACAN, we're the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, the peak um, consumer um, body in the telecommunications sector. Um, and you know, one of the things that we're very aware of is the profound um, ability of digital technology to enable people, uh, to provide opportunities for people, um, and you know how important that is as, as digital technologies become increasingly essential in pretty much everyday, now everyday lives, you know, the opportunities to um, gain employment and education are now being delivered online. Um, increasing number of, of government services are being um, delivered online first. Uh, you know, the services that we engage with on a day-to-day -day basis, such as banking and, and our service providers, and, and of course, the ability to stay connected with our family and friends, um, you know, is increasingly um, made possible by uh, connectivity and digital inclusion. Um, you know, the Australian government has a plan for Australia to be a leading digital economy by 2030. Um, and you know, as Liz had said, there's a number of a number of groups of people who um, are going to need to be brought along and provided um, the opportunity to engage and get connected. If we're all going to benefit from that digital economy and 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 the the you know outcomes of those opportunities for the whole of Australia are going to be dependent on everybody being able to participate and contribute. Um, so as was discussed in Liz, Liz's um, presentation, the Australian Digital Inclusion Index highlights a lot of those uh, groups that are less digitally included, um, you know, uh, and 
you know, primarily those are seniors and people with disability, people on low incomes, people in regional areas, um, First Nations, Australians, and um, people with, with low uh, literacy skills. And, uh, you know, there's a, con there's a number of contributing barriers to the, um, the exclusion of these uh, cohorts. There's, there's a whole host of different and intersected um, aspects or barriers that, that create this digital exclusion, you know, issues that, were, that Liz touched on of affordability. Um, you know, we've heard, uh, you know, recently with COVID and how COVID has really um, exacerbated the digital divide for a lot of people. Uh, you know, we heard stories of families where, you know, children are uh, doing homeschooling and their connectivity is dependent on, you know, um, broadband um, hotspot or families who have multiple children who are reliant on doing homeschooling with a shared laptop or a shared um, iPad amongst the children. So there's, you know, significant issues of affordability. Um, and again, then there's the digital capability that Liz mentioned, um, access to the appropriate equipment, which is of specific interest to consumers with disability because many people with disability need specific equipment. It's um, you know, an assistive technology. And then, of course, you know, one of the big issues, as was also mentioned earlier, was the confidence of people to feel that they can connect safely and confidently and are not going to be at harm using um, and connecting the technology. So, you know, as I said, the intersectionality of this um, has significant, uh, creates significant barriers for people. Um, you know, most people um, in, in the inclusion index don't sit neatly within one of those categories. We have, uh, you know, we're very aware that people with disability in Australia are overrepresented in the numbers of people living in poverty um, with regards to seniors. Many seniors have age related impairments such as hearing or vision impairments or um, motor skill deterioration. Uh, you know, the, many seniors are people who have uh, live on low incomes or fixed incomes. And, and of course, you know, there's also the intersectionality of those people who live in regional Australia. So all of those those um, different aspects create, you know, compound the um, the digital inclusion and the barriers for people with disability, with, for people um, who fall into those categories outlined in the uh, the index. Um, so you know, what's great from this uh, discussion today is that the research that that Bernardo and the team have done are really starting to show us some of the significant areas of exclusion um, with seniors and also some of the possibilities where um, we can make change and start putting um, initiatives in place to improve the uh, level of digital inclusion of these people. Um, so just um, briefly, I'd just like to talk about a couple of the initiatives that ACAN works on in this area. Uh, and firstly, we have our um, No Australian Left Offline campaign, which we've had running for a few years now. It started uh, prior to um, COVID, but it's um, being with COVID, it's sort of really highlighted the essentiality of, of um, No Australian Left Offline. And what we're calling for in this campaign is a low priced MBN um, fixed home service, uh, calling for a 50 megabits per second service with a wholesale price of $20 per month and a suggested retail price of $30 a month. And uh, we've identified a significant a uh, number of people who would who would really benefit from this um, and those are people who meet a number of eligibility criteria for low income support um, so that's an issue that we've been pushing quite 
for quite a long time and making some good progress and actually getting some really good support from a number of our uh, members and community supporters. And quickly, just another of the initiatives is the accessible, accessible telecommunications service. And um, that's a service that's essentially an information resource uh, where we provide information free of charge and it's up to date and independent information about the accessibility features of both mainstream and assistive patients equipment and products that are suitable for people with a range of um, impairments so people with disability CS. Um, primarily it's offered through the online um, accessible telecoms.org.au but we also have a free phone service where people can call if they don't have access to the internet and one of the team members will walk them through and provide them with the information about the devices that would be best suited for their needs uh, so I'll just to leave it at that, but really happy to participate and think it's great that we've all come together to discuss this really important issue and look forward to the questions at the end. Thanks, Bernard. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, it was um, good to hear about, uh, you know, some of the, the things from your side and the initiatives that ACON are, is conducting, you know, they seem good to help, especially with the accessibility um, component of digital inclusion. So thank you very much. Um, just reminding you that you can put your questions in the Q&A uh, and we'll read them at the end. I'll now introduce our next uh, presenter, which is uh, Glenn Wall. Glenn Wall is the Vice President of the University of the Third Age Network Victoria, or U3A, and he's also the President of U3A Whistlesea. He facilitates classes on technology for seniors with a focus on the use of technology as an enablement tool. He also leads the U3A Building Community Engagement Program and liaises with Victorian government on programs that reduce seniors' isolation and loneliness. Glenn is the U3A uh, lead in the Shaping Connections Research Program, which was created by our MIT University and U3A. And today, Glenn will present uh, an innovative approach to develop the digital literacy skills of seniors in order to enable them to confidently connect online to the digital economy and improve their well being. We are delighted to have you, Glenn. Thanks very much, Bernardo. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon, and I'm looking forward to sharing over the next few minutes uh, experiences that um, our organization has had looking to improve the digital literacy of uh, our membership base. Background, and perhaps if I could have the first slide up, I want to touch very quickly or very, uh, very quickly on background and what COVID has meant to our organisation. We have 104 U3As across Victoria and prior to uh, the pandemic, we had uh, around 38,000 members. The challenge to us was that that age range ranged from 50 to 100. And when you look on the slide at what we know and what my previous two speakers have outlined, there was a very clear evidence base that seniors were digitally uh, excluded, they didn't necessarily have the capability ability to connect digitally. So the experience we started to see in the evidence was something like 50% um, of seniors on the ADII score were effectively not, not considered to be digital literacy, uh, digitally literate for those over 65. So we were faced with an interesting challenge and I want to take the experience that we had into how we believe as an organisation we have been very successful in actually delivering a solution that connects seniors, which has a flow on effect across the generation gap. So we're all aware that um, pandemic, uh, pandemic not only did it uh, close meetings in venues down completely, 
social distancing also meant that we couldn't get as many people together. The challenges in using technology to connect became very apparent. There was starting to be a build up of fear of meeting face to face and seniors becoming comfortable staying at home. The difficulty that that started to, uh, we started to notice was withdrawal of people and lack of connection started to have some serious effects on health and well-being. So we saw a need to create a point of access for U3A members to actually source information and keep connected. And the growing isolation and loss of community connection, uh, I think has been well uh, discussed by the previous two speakers. So there was a perception that seniors wouldn't take up technology, there was fear of technology. And I use the word perception in the context of what we found was seniors did learn how to use technology if they had a need. Next slide, please. So the next slide actually summarises we had to move from the top uh, slide of classroom or bringing people together in a venue to using Zoom and think of the challenge in a person in their 80s wanting to connect with others, wanting to perhaps visit a, uh, a husband in care and they couldn't get into the venue. Their only alternative was to be able to use technology. So we had to move into that environment and we found that um, and sharing some experience with you, when you're on Zoom trying to explain on the phone to a senior person who didn't have a lot of technology experience, how to click on a link in an email, collect, connect to uh, their microphone and camera and talk to other friends. So we found that it was important, one, to have patience, two, to take a view that we really needed to start to identify what the interests and the needs were of the individual uh, individuals that wanted to connect. The second uh, panel of uh, images, we found that bringing together a person who had another group that were interested in, in connecting, we could show them how to connect via Zoom and have a cup of coffee from home and keep connected and discuss things of interest to them. The other three slide, the three images, it became very clear that as, and I think was outlined uh, very well in Liz's um, uh, presentation, that we needed to have a safe, environment, almost a one-on-one -on -one support, and it had to be able, we had to be able to show a person how to use a device. The interesting uh, feedback we started to get was in one instance, and I'll apologise that it is fairly graphic, there was an art tutor who hadn't used Zoom before, was into his 80s and wanted to take an art class on Zoom. The interesting reaction was that he was able to be shown how to take that class and effectively was able then to show his class on Zoom how to, uh, uh, that had a flow on effect. Next slide please. The, I'll bring the, the 
the summary together. Our model basically is to look at how to or to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer shared knowledge approach and to use the, the concept of taking kits to people, whether that be on the internet, over Zoom, or whether it be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So in rounding off and summarising where our approach has reached, we've had very valuable uh, collaborations, which has enabled us to train something like 300 U3A and tutors and leaders, and that's had a significant flow and effect. The learnings of the Shaping Connections Research Project has effectively given us uh, an insight, and by looking at taking what we found in that, it's enabled us to develop this approach and I'd be happy to take any questions in the question and answer time. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, always impressed with the amount of innovation that happens at U3A. I think that's one of your biggest assets. Um, looking forward to the Q&A with you. Um, the next speaker is Professor Mike Reed. Um, Mike Reed is Professor uh, of Marketing at RMIT University and Director of the RMIT Consumer Wellbeing Research Group. He's also a member of the Shaping Connections Network. Mike has commercial and academic research experience employing mixed methods designs for a range of social marketing and consumer problems. Mike's research is focused on ICT and aging, so um, information uh, communication technology and aging, healthy middle aging and age-based stereotype threats, food literacy in parents and children, health eating, behavioral change and economic abuse in young adults. Lots of things. <laughs> Mike will be speaking uh, to the most recent report produced by the Shaping Connections Group in partnership with Aiken and U3A. The report is being launched today, so you'll be the first to have access and to hear about it. Thank you for joining us today, Mike. Thank you, Bernardo, and thanks everybody for attending today. Really, this is one of the first opportunities we've had to expose our research to a, a wider audience. You know, our, our research is, is really focused on older adults, uh, and consumers and, you know, the notion of exclusion and digital exclusion and inclusion. You know, we know that it's a significant threat to the well-being uh, of, of old adults, particularly in these times of, of a pandemic. You know, at, at the risk of, I guess, repeating what some of the others uh, in the presentations have said today, you know, when we think of exclusion, you know, we can think of it, particularly with ad older adults, we can think of it as having a number of elements that help frame our research really. Uh, we look at exclusion in terms of older populations between older adults and groups of older adults. So we have to think about the different old seniors and different older adult groups and how exclusion plays out for those uh, groups. And also between uh, seniors, older adults and the different life stages as well. How does it differ or compare to younger groups, for example? You know, we need to consider issues of, of, of agency and things like whether exclusion is, is voluntary, that is someone has actively chosen to exclude themselves, we sometimes forget that, or whether they've been excluded you know, against their will, whether it's deliberately or through some element of neglect uh, or poor design. So for example, poor design of apps or websites uh, of hardware or software. So there's different types of exclusion. You know, we need to, to consider how, how dynamic uh, exclusion is for older adults. It, how is digital and social exclusion experienced over time? And does it come and go? Are there points of time, but points in the life stage, points in a year, points in somebody's life where exclusion is, is, is experienced more or less? And we also need to consider how, how dynamic exclusion is for older adults. You know, how is digital and, and social exclusion it, it, fit into the ecosystem, fit into their uh, life trajectory, fit into their life goals. So there's a multi-dimensionality to uh, exclusion that frames some of our research uh, as well. Now, from the perspective of, of engagement with ICT and the digital environment, you know, it, it, it is, it is, isn't it, one of those ways in which seniors, old, older consumers can be engage with their friends, uh, engage with their community, and importantly too, from a consumption perspective, engage with the economy. 
uh, becoming more and more important to be able to utilize the tools and, and things that are available to us to engage uh, with the economy. Uh, for this research, uh, obviously the Shaping Connections team, myself and, and, and my colleagues, you know, collaborated with U3A communities throughout the pandemic uh, with a grant, as mentioned, supported by ACAN. We thank both of those groups uh, profusely for their uh, involvement uh, and allowing us to utilize their resources. We, we explored perceptions of risk. You know, and that is, you know, the notion of perceptions is incredibly important. If people feel they can't engage, if they feel excluded, if they feel tensions and fears, then that acts as a barrier to both behavior, going online, using the tools, or indeed the adoption of new tools or the willingness to engage uh, in different um, um, technologies. So next slide, please. Really quickly, I mean, we, we said we're looking at perceptions of risk and, you know, stories in the media, experiences of friends, uh, the, the participants' own experiences of scams and frauds of being targeted by email really did shape the tensions and challenges that they felt in engaging with ICT and being digitally included uh, and not excluded. You know, over 70% of our, our participants said they'd been targeted by emails that looked to th do things like gather their personal information or threaten them to pay up if, without, or they'd have problems with their computers and, and, and equipment. You know, one interviewee recounted, you know, being contacted by somebody from a, from a telco, and, and in their words, they were so damn convincing I gave them my bank number but after finishing the call, realized that they'd been scammed uh, and reported it to, to the bank. Another big part of our, our, our work, particularly in the quantitative side, is to, be, to, to look at the, the different risk perceptions. Uh, through our interviews and through the literature, we came up with 41 items related to perceived risk. And after analyzing those, we distilled them down into six main risk factors. We call them operational and functional risk, you know, forgetting passwords. We call them personal and social risk, uh, being made fun of or feeling incompetent. Uh, privacy transaction risk, you know, losing privacy. Uh, purchase risk, not receiving goods you've paid for. Overspending, you know, the cost of devices uh, and the cost of apps and updating. And physical harm risk, things like eye strain, uh, re repetitive strain type injuries. You know, although our participants had um, relatively low perceptions of risk, uh, they were high for areas like operational risk, like privacy and transaction risk and overspending risk. You know, I won't go into details, um, you can ask us later, but things like digital literacy helped overcome that, uh, as did uh, being single, uh, being partnered as opposed to uh, being single. Uh, next slide, please. You know, what does it really mean? So having looked at our research, we, there are a number of things that we can take away from this. You know, we need to help seniors, adults, uh, older adults, you know, be positive and open about being digitally included, about using ICT. We need to, you know, foster and enable support from socialization agents, from their families, from their friends, but also from mentors and mavens, those that part of their network that help them understand what's going on and to engage with technology. We need to be willing and motivated to engage with the entities that provide non-judgmental support, such as U3A, such as libraries. And, and we need to you know, think about how do we foster and maintain people's digital literacy uh, over the course of their aging from retirement to onwards. Uh, next slide, please. You know, from a what does it mean perspective, well, for those in government agencies, from NGOs and others, what does it mean? It means understanding what seniors are really wanting to do and achieve through their digital engagement, not from our perspective, but from their perspective. Being more nuanced and considering seniors not as homogenous maps, but really segmenting segment uh, seniors and understanding the different groups that exist and the different uh, programs and communications that we need to put in place. How do we effectively foster engagement with, with U3A entities or libraries or, or life club associations? How do we support families and others? 
you know, we expect them to do things, but do we teach them, train them, educate them in a way that they can competently uh, and with less stress help their, you know, their older adults, their grandparents or parents? Uh, and then really trying to understand, you know, the, the, the ecosystem that includes mavens and digital connectors. Look, I've really just scratched the surface of what we've done and what we're doing. Uh, and so I encourage you to look at the report and I encourage you to ask any questions. So thanks very much. Thank you, Mike, uh, for you know this uh, brief presentation on the report. I think one, one thing that's important to, to note is that we've done this work with U3A, but now this survey instrument has been created. So we are open to working with other organizations to use the same instrument. And then in partnership with you, we might collect and see how uh, risk perceptions are faring in your organization or in your membership. And that would allow us to compare with the numbers that we have with U3A and then see how you're faring if better or worse and see maybe what are the points of improvement. Just putting it out there, there will be a link on the uh, Q&A that uh, will be uh, helpful. Um, now, we are going to change and start the Q&A session. I think we had great four uh, talks here. And uh, as we, I'll ask the guests to turn on the camera so that we can all be here. And I will follow um, the um, most liked questions. So we kind of follow a more <laughs> democratic uh, take on the questions here. So the first one, the most liked question so far is one from Alice Garner. Um, and it says, in society in which school education and healthcare are supposed to be free, how can we go about lobbying effectively to have digital access without which many can literally not survive or become literate or numerate, classified as essential service and fully supported across different government levels? That's a, that's a very good question. And <laughs> not sure if anyone has an answer per se, but I mean, I would like to hear some of the comments um, on it. How do we go about lobbying effectively the digital access? I can make us. I'll go on Wayne, and then I can go after you, Wayne. Okay, thanks, Liz. Well, I think um, you know one of the. It's a really great question. First off, thanks. Um, you know, it is becoming increasingly, or perhaps has already become an an essential part of daily life, modern day life in Australia. So I think uh, you know we're most everybody's on the same page with that. That you know access is. Um, access to uh, digital connectivity is essential. Um, I think one of the ways, you know, that I briefly mentioned um, with us, with ACAN's No Australian Left Offline campaign, you know, that's a, a strong campaign to try to make sure that uh, access to NBN connectivity is affordable for all Australians. And, um, you know there there needs to be some type of subsidy for a lot of people so i think that's a, a really good starting point to make sure that you know affordability of uh, national infrastructure is not a barrier for all australians to be able to get connected so i think that's you know that's a, a really good start um so to let, let liz have a go now thanks thanks wayne liz yeah, look, again, I, I completely agree, Wayne, and um, and it's a really great question, and it's certainly something that we've been, um, I guess, A, advocating for, but also then looking at um, kind of bringing together all the different collective groups that need to be involved in that conversation, because it is a tricky one, and obviously healthcare covers so many different, you know, there's federal government, there's state government, and then kind of individual um, kind of health and hospital services themselves. So um, we've actually been running a series called the Expanding Digital Health Series over the last 18 months. Um, and that was actually um, bringing together then a lot of the groups that, you know, recognise the issue that, um, that that widening digital divide actually is also having an impact on some of those vulnerable groups that already have lower health outcomes um, due to, you know, lower socioeconomic 
um, locations and um, affordability and all of those kind of things. And then you're adding on an extra level of then digital technology to access healthcare services or, you know, access um, reliable health information online. You know, there's, there's a whole gamut now of, of apps and technology that's being used in that digital health space. So it's really looking at how do we address this across the board, but, you know, it's both government, but also then getting the research from from universities and organisations that are actually then working on the ground with people as well and being able to kind of understand the issue and then how do we best help and support people to do that and it's very much certainly our experience it is that kind of on the ground support that you know Glenn's talking about Wayne's talking about it's it's enabling that support for people in their local areas um, trusted sources of, of information um, and, and yeah just kind of coordinated approach nationally really but at a local scale yeah, very good points to this um glenn do you do you, did you want to comment on it you ha you have your mute button on so wonders of modern technology uh, <laughs> just a, i think we're hitting a phase now where there's very good uh, evidence or stories of experiences Going back to the comment Liz made, if we can collect those being what I'd call in the front line, actually living those experiences, and I'll, I'll aim it on seniors, but it can be extrapolated, that gives the evidence base and we're starting to see the value of the benefits. So I'd urge anyone listening today to think through listening to what the outcomes are and that's going to add to the good work that uh, both ACAN and um, uh, Good Things Foundation are doing. Thank you, Glenn. Mike, would you like to comment on that or should I ask the next question? Oh, look, I think I think the others have covered that really well. You know, as, as I said, from a research side, it's about bringing the consolidated research voice to bear. You know, there's lots of amazing research that's being done in this space, but it's how do you bring it together in a very powerful way so that that, that, that voice of the customer, as Glenn was talking about, that voice of the consumer, the older adult or the excluded individual, is really front and centre of those who have to make resourcing decisions and provide that support. Yeah, that's that's very good. Now I'll ask another question, which was not my question, but I it was a question that was in my mind anyway. So there you go. <laughs> the Australian Digital Index uh, Inclusion <laughs> Index indicates that people uh, from cold backgrounds are above the index for digital inclusion. This is not the experience of cold communities that our organization and other uh, organizations work with. Is called a whole um, as a whole sufficient indicator in measuring digital inclusion exclusion. Uh, mode of migration and English illiteracy, for example, may be some of the subcategories that can shed light into more light into this. Any any views on this? It's it's uh, the, the the index does does uh, depict called uh, backgrounds as above the 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 line. When it's it's different from the experience on you know when you're looking talking to these groups, um, what what's your view on this? Bernardo, we we have done some work with um, the peak bodies in various um, cold communities. And what we've found is that there's a very strong uh, trusted connector point in each cold community. Mm -hmm where that person tends to be the go-to person. We've got one, uh, one particular experience where uh, giving support to a committee of a peak body to uh, be able to go online through the lockdown had a flow on effect to something like 28 other leaders in that community that flowed on to another 68. So I think I'd share the inference in the question that uh, it's how you, how we're able to connect into those leaders of the communities and there's a very strong network appearing to be, be evolving behind it. 
also, the other thing I think I would definitely say that that the cold is a broad, it is a very broad group um, of people with very varying levels of um, both English and digital literacy. So I think certainly when we've been looking at which groups do we put our kind of priorities towards and, and really put efforts towards supporting. Um, we've been working a lot with the Settlement Council of Australia and working more for the new migrants and refugees because they, of that group, they seem to be the particularly, the, the least, of, you know, initially included groups because there's many, I think, cold, you can also then break that down by age group, um, you know, which particular countries they're coming from. So there's a whole heap of, some are very, very highly skilled and, um, you know, some are obviously less skilled. So we, we put a lot of focus in that migrants and refugees, new migrants and refugees. Yeah, thank you, uh, Liz. Uh, Wayne, uh, we have a question from Susan Webster to you. Um, and it's a question, uh, uh, please give more details of Aiken's campaign for low cost broadband and sufficient bandwidth. You say that you're having success in this campaign. Can you give more details, please? Sure. So the campaign is called No Australian Left Offline. Um, it's a campaign that we have been running for a couple of years, well, probably like uh, almost three years now, um, to ensure that people who are on low incomes can have affordable access to NBN fixed services um, so that people can have a have an NBN connection connection in their home and um, success um, progress is probably the better word than success we've been progressing this and um, you know the unfortunate one of the unfortunate um, silver cloud, I guess, part of the COVID is that it's really brought this into stark relief how important um, the affordability of NBN services is for low income Australians. Um, one of the most recent uh, things we've been having discussions with decision makers, the NBN, with the community sector and consumer groups to progress this. Um, you know, there, there has been um, discussion in the most recent NBN consultation around pricing um, about, you know, is there a need for a low income product? So that's a good um, acknowledgement from, from NBN's perspective that, you know, this is something that needs to be investigated. Um, on, us, on the uh, ACAN website, there's lots of information about the campaign and how other people and organizations can support the campaign. Um, I think uh, in the next few months, we will probably be having a further consultation with the sector to make sure that, you know, the things that have been happening um, over the recent months are, are progressing the campaign in the direction that we want to, to go. Uh, ultimately, you know, we want to see a 50 megabit um, service around at around a $30 per month retail price um, for eligible consumers who you know meet, meet a fairly broad um, range of uh, income support programs. Yeah, well, thank you, Wayne. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, the questions are popping up and the people are super interested, but we need to wrap up the session as uh, it has come to an end. Uh, we'll save your questions and try to see if we can get the participants to answer these questions. Uh, some are quite interesting and deserve to be answered, uh, but we have had great talks and fantastic uh, Q&A. Um, if you want to get involved with the Shaping Connections program, you can go to our website, www.shapingconnections.org, or email me at bernardo.figueredo at rmit.edu.au. Um, and finally, on behalf of RMIT and the Shaping Connections Network, I would like to thank you all for attending the webinar and a big, big thanks for our amazing speakers. Uh, I don't have to put hands together. Liz, Wayne, Glenn and Mike, it has been a, a, a great session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.